Um, I'd like to introduce Gloria and Christy next. Uh, it's my absolute pleasure, especially seeing as how they're both tech speakers like me. Uh, Christy is an outreach intern at Mozilla working with diversity and inclusion. Uh, she's a basketball player, even though I, I always want to say baseball. And uh, she loves chocolate, and apparently if she's not at home, she's in the gym. Uh, we're going to assume this is sort of a gym, though. Uh, Gloria is a student, an engineering student at the Pire Pireus University of Applied Sciences. And she's been volunteering with uh, an active listening site called Seven Cups of Tea. Uh, please join me in welcoming them on stage. So, hello everyone. Uh, I am Christy Progri, as Alex also introduced me. I'm a Mozilla tech speaker and also a Mozilla representative. I am the board member and chairman of the Open Labs, which is a local hacker space that we have in Albania, in Tirana. Uh, I'm a SitePoint author, and I also finished my studies this year for international affairs and diplomacy. Uh, I'm going to start my presentation, first of all, with uh, some numbers, because it has to do like, with the women, uh, with the involvement of women in open source projects. And uh, in a survey done at uh, 2002, uh, it was the, the number of women of the contributors were only 1.1%, but then on 2013, uh, the number were 11%. So we can see that the number is higher, but it's still not the number that we're uh, fighting for and not the amount that we would like to see in FLOSS communities. And uh, only 1.5% of the free and open source software developers are female. And related to the GitHub users, 5.4% uh, of GitHub users are uh, with, with over 10 contributions from a random sample are female and among women who joined the tech industry 56% uh, uh, live by mid-career which is double the attrition rate for men usually the reasons that they leave the career by in, in the middle age is because they have to take care of the children and then they become mom and uh, the, all, the, all the energy goes somewhere else like not in this area. And uh, here are the numbers of the repos that are uh, done with like from the female and from the male. As you can see from the chart, the number of the, of the women is like really, really low related to the contributions of, uh, of the male and the number of the repositories. And uh, we have spotted out also some issues that we think that why does this uh, low number come from? First of all, uh, there is an uh, invis invisibility, like there are a lot of cases where we are, for example, uh, where there are a lot of people and women actually who are developers, are, uh, people behave like they are not there and they usually try to avoid the eye contact and in this way they do not really feel very uh, comfortable to, to go on and to express like themselves. Expressionalism, gender, uh, gender essentialism, and social expectations and sexualized are also some other issues. Uh, the stereotypes there in the society that women cannot really do the tasks that are meant for men is also a very big problem because this affects a lot on the uh, self-esteem since they think that they will not be capable to do something that is only meant for men. and. Uh, usually they also do not feel well when they are in an environment and they are expected to uh, be valued from, for their information and, uh, for, for, and for their work, but they get uh, you know, compliments or opinions or you know, words that are not related to their work but to something else. Uh, there are a lot of initiatives done related to this. Uh, Mozilla has an initi initiative called Duomos. And 
Uh, it's only for yeah, women and Mozilla. It's a community composed of members from different open source projects when they can all gather there, share their opinions, uh, their thoughts, their insights related to different experiences. Uh, so in this way, when uh, we exchange you know, the opinions, this will help us improve our work and have also a better performance like in, in different tasks. Uh, it is mainly dedicated to improving women's visibility and involvement in free and open source. And uh, it's free so everyone can participate despite their background or if they come from a technical one or from a non-technical. It's also written in our manifesto that it's a resource that internet is a resource that must remain open and accessible. So this is also in our constitution that uh, Mozilla and it, it's open like to everyone. Uh, Women's is a very active, active group, full of ideas, things to do, and we discuss there a lot of topics. There are a lot of channels that uh, we go uh, and that people can have information from. We have uh, our own website, womos.rg. You can find us on Facebook, IRC channel, uh, Telegram, mailing list, and in your state. So if you live in a country, and you have like a Mozilla community there, you can join and you can see there, there might be a group that are only for women or for people from underrepresented groups that can uh, be part of, of, or if there isn't any group like that, you can uh, feel free to start their, to, to start a new one. Uh, there are a lot of uh, initiatives that are going parallel with the WOMOS. There, are, there is also the outreachy. I don't know if you have heard about it, but it's an internship that is like for three months and it's paid. And it's only for women and for people from underrepresented groups. There are a lot of uh, projects uh, which uh, aims to like and, and which contributes in the outreach so they can get interns and to really uh, to really inspire them to continue their work. As I mentioned during the beginning, uh, in um, I, we have a local hacker space back in, in Albania, and the situation is like completely different from the hacker space or from the uh, other floss communities like around Europe, as far as I've seen. And there are 70% of the contributors are women, so like there is a higher number of women than men that do contribute in floss, like in Mozilla, in Fedora, in Linux, and in OpenStreetMap. So the men are in minorities. And uh, this also comes from the educational system. This affects a lot the educational system. Like they do really uh, inspire the women, especially to go into study tech, because it's seen also as a field that despite that you can have a good career, which will help you like in the future, it will, it also is well paid and you can, you can like reach and you can go like how far that you want like relate to this. But uh, during uh, parallel with outreach, there are also other, um, other projects that do inspire women to participate in. Like there is, for example, Google Summer of Code or other internships that are really mainly and focused only to empower and to make the people coming from underrepresented groups to express and to share like their experience and thought without the fear of being uh, judged and just to live how they really and just to act like how they really want in communities like this. Uh, so this was like for my part. Now please welcome my colleague, is Gloria. So she is going to talk about uh, diversity user research. Uh, hi everyone. I'm going to talk about diversity user research and in specific how to become a better listener. My name is Gloria Jumo. Uh, here are different links where you can find me, my personal website where I have different blog posts about things I say, and my LinkedIn. And I would like to tell you today that the goal of this talk is to help you to be able to extract more information from your user research, in specific for diversity. But this specific skill that I'll teach you today, which is called active listening, can help you in different areas of your career. And uh, 
notice that since I learned this skill, uh, my emotional intelligence have uh, highly improved. So that is why I believe that it's very important that you take these next 10 minutes to pay attention to what I have to say. And um, do you know that there's a research that says that only 2% of people have um, done classes about listening? And we do classes every day about writing and we do classes about reading, but we're never taught how to listen. And that also is a skill. And um, that is what one thing that we are going to learn today. And hopefully you'll be part of that 2% that has done a formal class in listening. So uh, one thing that is very important in listening is your body language. Because, for example, if you're talking to someone and, you're, and when the person is talking to you, you're yawning during the research, uh, the person will think that you're bored. So then they'll start like cropping things and cropping important information. So your body language plays a very important role. But unfortunately, because of time, we won't touch on that now. Uh, and we'll, but we'll touch on specific aspect, which is listening. Let me first say the difference of hearing and listening. Hearing is... Uh, the act of perceiving sounds. For example, you're in this room right now, you're hearing different noises, you're per perceiving different sounds. But that doesn't mean that you are listening to each and every sound. The person or the sound that you concentrate on, that you actually uh, set your ears on and you process what that thing or person is saying, is the person whom you are listening to. For example, if you're listening to what I'm saying and you're processing it, that means that you are listening to me. And that is more active than hearing that happens like without you even needing to do anything subconsciously. Uh, uh, what I'm going to talk about specific is active listening. Active listening is a skill which is what it says, active listening. Listening actively and trying to understand deeply uh, the person that you are talking to. Um, these are some of the benefits of it. Uh, I'll just say one for example, like it improves your interpersonal skills. Uh, because the more you are able to listen to people, the more people like you, because people like to talk a lot about themselves or the things that they do. So if you can listen to them, then they'll most likely like you. And then another thing, but here also are some of the disadvantages of active listening in specific, because there's a technique called mirroring, where you try to uh, rephrase what someone is saying. And when you always rephrase what someone is saying, uh, even though that's helpful in some way, it can also sound like parroting, like you are a parrot and you are repeating, repeating whatever the person is saying. So that is one of the disadvantages, and here are more that you can see. And what I'm going to say now, I've break it into three sections, into comprehension, retention, and response. Uh, when you're talking to someone during a research, you want to actually comprehend what they're saying. So to comprehend what they're saying, there are different skills. One of them, one of the things that you can use is reflection. Reflection is when someone tells you something, you try to reflect back what they're saying. For example, someone tells you that, um, I'm very excited. So reflection is saying, so is you saying, so you mean that you are very excited today, right? That is reflection. Another thing is clarification. To get clarification, you can do different things. One of them is asking open-ended or close-ended questions. And I'll get into a deeper explanation of those things in the next few minutes. Uh, one thing that I want to emphasize on right now is this technique here, response, which helps you get more, a better response from the user. It's called funneling. Uh, funneling. And with that technique, what you do is you're actually trying to extract more general information from someone or more specific information from someone. And to do that, I'll use an example of FOSDEM. For example, someone tells you, I'll be attending FOSDEM. If you ask the person, tell me more about this, that is asking something uh, asking something that will give you more general information. Because when you say, tell me more about it, someone will give you a general information about it. But when you say, um, what time are you going to force them? And which talk are you going to attend? That is more specific. And by asking this question, you are asking, you are getting more specific information. So that is one way you can use this technique called funneling. And right now, I have a scenario here that I will run through it fast. So in this scenario, I'm conducting a research to identify why there is underrepresentation of a specific minority group in the open source community. That can be 
like uh, maybe women or people from a specific race or people from a specific gender, just about anything. And through this um, demonstration also you have, you can use the skill called active listening to get more information from that person. So for example, we are in the interview and I, the interviewer, I'm saying, hello, my name is Gloria. I'm from this company and today I'm conducting this research. Uh, is that okay with you? The person says, yes, thank you very much. Is that okay with you? Makes you understand if the person is ready for your research. So by asking that question, it helps the person feel more comfortable that, okay, yes, I'm ready. When they answer, yes, I'm ready, let's start. So as I move on during the conversation, I tell the person to tell me a bit about their background. That things help the person to open up to me because when I tell them, tell me a bit about your background, the person now starts diving into their life and the more personal things that they share, the more closer to me they feel and the more they trust me. So by doing that, I'm actually getting the person to open up. Then as you're speaking, I tell the person, oh, that's interesting. Can you tell me a bit about your experience with open source? Then the person ta starts narrating to me a story of uh, when I started contributing to open source, I felt very alienated because I felt invisible. And even though I was contributing, like people didn't cheer me up enough or I just felt that I wasn't appreciated. So a key word here is alienation. The person said that they felt alienated during the interview. Uh, so, at that moment, you can use a technique in active listening called sympathy, no, called empathy, but right now, I'll explain to you what sympathy is and what empathy is. Sympathy is saying something like, oh, sorry about that, but empathy is actually saying, like, an example, like, okay, this time of my life, I also experienced alienation, and that makes you build a connection with the person because you are putting yourself in their shoes. So they feel that, okay, this person is also putting themselves in a vulnerable state. So maybe they understand me. So by doing that, by putting yourself in the shoe of that person, you are exercising empathy. And when at some point of the interview, the person tells me that I feel that people, like, that people like me are just not for open source involvement or tech. Forcing ourselves into this industry is futile, or our ratio in comparison to that of others proves that. When someone tells you that, you somehow feel like there's a trigger, like you want to tell the person, no, uh, you are not invisible in tech, we like you. But when you do that, you're actually kind of like indirectly judging the person, telling them no, what you're saying is not true, we like you, it's not like that. So at that point, one of the skills that you have to use is deferring, uh, deferring, jud uh, deferring judgment. And to defer judgment, what you do is actually when someone tells you something that's a trigger, you don't say how you feel about it. Instead, you focus on how they feel about it. What made you feel like you are invisible? Like, what made you feel um, scared? Or why do you feel that uh, you don't have a place in tech? When you ask that question instead, you are getting more information up from the person instead of saying like, no, what you're saying is not true. Then the person closes down on you and won't tell you their actual deep feelings. So then by actually asking them more questions and deferring your judgment, you extract more information from the person and then you get more accurate results in your diversity research. So in the end, one thing that you can always do is summarize, summarize what the person tell, told you, and that helps you get clarification that you understood what, you, what they said, because if you say it wrong, the person will correct you. But it also helps you reinforce what you have spoken about, which means that it will help you retain that information more easily. So that's it about what I had to say. Uh, as I said, here are some keywords to remember, reflect, summarize, clarify, and empathy. And my call to action to you is to practice this and let me know your results. You can find uh, ways to contact me on my website and feel free to connect to me on LinkedIn. Uh, do you have any questions for me and Christy? Uh, anyone that has any question for either the talk me or Christy gave, you can raise your hands. Uh,
Okay. Uh, I think that a good way to to have like more women getting involved is like putting uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, is like uh, putting um, a, uh, a number that you you for example want to have like 50-50 and in the in the process uh, that you're hiring new people you get more focused on uh, in, uh, hiring more women than men or another thing that you can do is like for not like taking uh, or being influenced to only employ men you can have like uh, they, they can all have the, the interview like on the paper and, the, and you don't know the gender of the person that you're uh, taking the information from. So th this is also a way that you will not get influenced by, the, by their gender, but you are going to hire them from really from their values or from their amount of you know, information that they have related to something. Because also, because there was done a survey that uh, related uh, to that, like women were better developer than men, but they were not hired because in the beginning the uh, the person that were going to hire them knew that they were women and they went with a stereotype that women do not know how to code so it's not they they were not get, like getting employed so this is also that i personally suggest that uh, like a politic that you can uh, use to hire and to have more women yes okay Okay, uh, so the question was on the politics, for example, that we need to take to have more women in uh, our work space, in our work or in different fields. In gender, uh, okay, so you ask about what about gender diversity that most people talk about. Um, yeah, so yeah, what I've, I know about that is that there are some universities in specific that are more tailored to specific racial, diver, uh, racial groups. So I believe that by companies going there in career first at those schools, they can locate more of those peoples. But at the same time, I believe that the way that they treat the companies treat the employees from those minority racial groups in their company uh, can also make them attract or repel people from that specific uh, demographic. So for those people, like for those uh, people that are minority by race, I feel that it's very important to make the environment very friendly and comfortable for them and to make sure that you create boundaries of what is allowed between how people deal with race and difference in the workplace. And one way, another way I think that they can fix that issue is to actually try to reach out to those people because usually companies, what they usually do is say, we want more people from this specific country come to us. They, they just sit down there and wait for those people to come to there. But that's not how it works. If you want something, you have to go get it. So you have to find where those people usually are located at and go there and tell them, I'm from this company. I have this to offer you. Do you have those skills that I'm looking for? And if yes, come, let's talk about it. That is what I feel. I think that it starts from the, not from the, it starts from the opportunities that some people have. Like for example, someone from a poor family that can't go to school, like whether the education there is good or not, like education is not the problem at that point. So it starts from the economy of the country or that specific family or that specific racial group as a whole. And then it moves on to education. And then from education, it moves on to companies. That is how I feel it starts from the economy and then education, and then to companies. So any other questions? I think, yeah, you had a question. Hi, thank you for your talk. It was nice. Mm. Um, do you have any figures about uh, the success of the outreach program in terms of working with a lot of people of minority groups, spreading us from the leaders, from Mozilla, or for other, uh, other sort of projects? OK, uh, I have information from Mozilla. Because even Gloria was an outreach intern in Mozilla back two, two years ago. 
uh, even when the outreach interns of Mozilla finished their internship there, uh, they still, they're very, like, inspired to still contribute and in, in Mozilla. They can get, like, uh, starting to contribute, for example, in diversity and inclusion team that we do have. Like, we do a really big work on doing some researches on on the things that we really really need to improve to get our communities more, more diverse. Or they can, for example, start contributing in technical areas. So the field is, like, really wide and they can find themselves wherever they 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 feel good. And there are a lot of like there are a lot of opportunities. Even if the outreach interns do not like find, for example, themselves afterwards in the in the company for for the for the foundation that they were that they have been working on, they can also uh, start to search and to see for other opportunities in other companies because. I think that with the, the gain of the experience that they take at outreach, uh, at, at outreach will help them a lot, like in every kind of job that they will have, like related to the topic that they have worked on and doing the researches. You're welcome. Uh, at the competition yesterday at Bean Lunch, the Software Conservatory who yeah, organized the uh, yeah. big one said that uh, around 40 or 50 percent of them get a job and continue. <coughs> and uh, one of the mo their successes, they are so proud of it, it's that uh, around a quarter of them become mentors for the other who come. And they even have a grand mentor that already like present currently. That, in specific, I'm not sure if it exists because it's very specific. Usually they do a more general interview, and then when there's a problem that they are trying to face, then it's when they go to more specific types of researches. So, if, for example, in diversity, I haven't really seen people using that skill, to be honest. So I don't really think that anything exists, but I can't be 100% sure. Uh, but even from my own research, when I was trying to find studies, on it in relation to interviewing, I couldn't find enough data. So I don't know about that. Yeah, maybe you can research and find something. I think there's one. Uh, maybe we can get one last one okay. at the back there. Yeah. 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 No, it was not for, for just the country. It's in, in general, yeah, it's in general terms. No, actually, this is interesting because the numbers are not like for a specific uh, country. It's like in general terms. And if, uh, for example, what I have um, spotted out is, like, is that in developed countries, like in Western Europe, uh, the number of women getting involved in flawless communities is really low. And this happens quite the opposite in the Balkans, for example. Uh, because the educational, I, I mentioned that the educational system is like a little bit different. Like we still have that Russian mentality on learning stuff. And while the Westerns come from a like, completely other field, like they give the space to and to, to attend like whatever school that they want to and they just like do not focus only getting a good job and uh, starting putting the energies on something that will uh, give like benefits then in the future. So uh, for example, if the numbers would have been, as I mentioned for Albania, they would be like completely different because the number of women are much higher than the men. But it's like, yeah, it is the opposite for the Western. So this is ju just like in the general view. Welcome. If you have any other questions, you can uh, catch each one of us. We'll be around here yeah, and ask us. Thank you very much.